Okay, so um, um, first of all, thank you for coming uh, this afternoon again. Uh, so today, uh, unlike last, yesterday, I will talk about uh, superconductivity, and for this I will study the simplest device one can make with superconductors, uh, which is a Josephson junction, where you have two superconducting contacts here in gray that will uh, induce superconductivity in a TI, which is here in, in purple, and uh, this will, um, this will uh, build a Josephson junction in which a supercurrent will flow. And this is uh, the analysis of this supercurrent that will maybe uh, yield some information on, on the uh, superconductivity and on, on its topological character. So this work has been done uh, while I was a postdoc in Würzburg a few years ago. Um, and I want to emphasize the, the help of our collaborators in, uh, in Tokyo and especially the role of, of Russell Deacon, the role, role of uh, Jonas Wiedemann, uh, my PhD student, and also the role of, of Tön Klapweich uh, uh, for his precious help. So first, I would like, I don't know uh, what backgrounds you have on, on Josephson junctions, and I need a few very specific points. So I would like to uh, start with a like, general introduction to Josephson junctions and to, uh, what, to, to, to what is expected in the case of a topological uh, super, uh, superconductivity. And then I will come to two types of experiments uh, that we've performed on, this, uh, on Josephson junctions based on the uh, mercury telluride, but now in the quantum spinal regime. Yesterday I talked about mercury telluride as a strain 3D uh, topological insulator. Today we will uh, only focus on mercury telluride as a quantum spinal insulator. And uh, I will show you these two types of experiments. So first, as a brief motivation, why do we study topological superconductivity? Uh, and how do we build it? Uh, well, first, topological superconductivity is, is uh, in, in, uh, in the specific case I'm addressing today, just the fact that um, you will try to form by inducing superconductivity, you will try to uh, induce some Cooper pairs in the TI, and these Cooper pairs are usually built from uh, electrons with uh, opposite momentum and opposite spins. And this gives you one relation between the momentum and the spin, and these electrons in the Cooper pairs also have to uh, follow the rule that there is uh, the spin momentum locking in the edge states, uh, which imposes another uh, constraint on the momentum and the spin. And because of this, the induced superconductivity that you will induce in the TI will have a special symmetry, will have some, some special helical character, which will uh, come from, from the uh, elicity of the edge states. And this will give rise to a special symmetry in the, in the superconductivity. And this has several consequences. One of them, which I will not address today, but which is quite interesting and, and uh, under investigation in Würzburg at the moment, is the fact that uh, because of this, some kind, some, uh, this, this ultimate spin-orbit coupling, you have a very uh, strange response to the magnetic field, and this can be uh, used to build some specific, specific Josephson junctions, which, which are called finite uh, Josephson junctions. But I will not address this, but uh, please read this paper if you're interested. Um, the point that I want to address here is the fact that even in the absence of magnetic field, there are special uh, states which live in the junctions, which are gapless Andreev bound states, sometimes called topological Andreev bound state, Majorana Andreev bound states, uh, they, which are precursors of, or which can be thought as precursors of Majoranas, and which will uh, be, which will form in the junction and will carry the current, the supercurrent, in the junction in a specific way. And I first want to uh, first recall how Josephson physics in general works, how these special Andreev bound states will make a difference in the Josephson effect, and how we've tried to detect it, and uh, up to which point we have managed to show that there's topological superconductivity. So first, uh, as a reminder, the, 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 the physics of the Josephson junction is basically governed by two equations, which are known under the name of Josephson equations. Um, and they govern any type of junction which is built between two superconductors separated by a thin non-superconducting material. And in general, this can be any material. This can be a normal um, metal. This can be an insulator. This can be a ferromagnet. Or in our case, this can be a topological insulator. And the basic idea is that some, somehow uh, 
specifically Josephson derived it for, for the case of the insulator, and this is where I will start from now. Uh, but in this, the basic idea is that the superconductivity will leak into this uh, central piece of material via proximity effect and on, on the length which is given by the coherence length. And this will uh, uh, yield some kind of coupling between the two electrodes. And if you solve this uh, uh, quantum mechanics 101 problem, then you can find two equations. One that govern the phase evolution of the phase difference between the two superconducting wave functions uh, that I wrote here. Uh, so this governs the difference of the phase phi 1 minus phi 2. And the second equations uh, we, which will um, uh, govern the uh, evolution of the current as function of the phase. So you see that uh, with these two equations, in principle, you can uh, derive two specific regime. One, which is the fact that, uh, for example, phi is constant. And if phi is constant, then this means there's a current which is smaller than this uh, crit so-called critical current IC, which will uh, flow in the junction. And if phi is constant, then d phi dt is zero, which means the voltage is zero. And this means that for this regime, you have a constant phase, you have a finite current, but zero voltage. So this is the supercurrent. On the opposite, when you, uh, when you want to push the current further than this critical current, then you immediately you see that there's no solution for which phi is constant, but you can find uh, easily a solution which is that uh, d phi, uh, which is uh, constant voltage, d phi dt uh, then um, um, is a constant, which means that phi, e phi evolves linearly with time, which means that you have an oscillating current. And this current oscillates at a frequency which is given by 2 eV over h, which is called the Josephson frequency. And this is the so-called AC Josephson effect. So you have these two regimes, and I will try to show you in uh, um, how these two equations are modified in the Josephson, uh, in the case of a, a topological Josephson insulate um, junction. Yes? So, in practice, it's mostly an applied current. So, I'll come to that distinction a bit, a bit later when I'll discuss uh, more in detail the experiment. Um, what I wanted to say here is that this equation here is a very fundamental one and is not changed. It just comes from um, uh, the Schrodinger equation and, and the phase difference, the evolution of the phase difference in the Schrodinger equation, and there's nothing you can do to change this equation. The other one, um, on the opposite, just depends on which type of material you put here to couple the two superconductors. And this is this equation that will change when you replace this normal insulator by a topological insulator. And I will show you how it, how it changes. Um, but to, 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 to tell you a bit more about this, I need to move away from this uh, simple uh, quantum mechanics problem in which I is supposed to be uh, uh, an insulator and go to a description that is more... Um, um, that is, uh, that is well adapted to mesoscopic systems and uh, which rely on, on um, the basic, the elementary pr principle of, of Andreev reflection. The, the idea is that if you have an electron that uh, impedes on this interface coming from a normal or, or, or conductor or topological <laughs> insulator, then the electron cannot enter the superconductor in this energy window that is given by uh, the superconducting gap. So if you want to have transport, then this means that you need to create a Cooper pair in the, in the superconducting uh, condensate, and this will uh, enforce the reflection of a hole. And this elementary mechanism is uh, known as Andreev reflection. It has, there are some constraints uh, on, on this elementary uh, process. Uh, first, there is energy and momentum conservation, which uh, gives this, uh, these two constraints. Another important ingredient is the fact that it's a quantum coherent process, so the phase of the superconducting condensate here will play a role, and specifically, there will be a phase shift on the wave function of the electron uh, as it, 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 uh, it is reflected, and the phase shift is given by this formula. 
And finally, there's the last constraint, which is the fact that uh, you need to have some spin conservation, which uh, tells you that the electron that impedes has to be reflected into an, a hole with the same spin. Uh, here you see naturally uh, several things. The first thing is here it's a very specific case of Andreev reflection. Uh, it's, a, it's a very specific case of reflection, it's Andreev reflection. But if the interface is a bit, um, is non-ideal, is imperfect, then you can also have just standard reflection on, on a potential barrier. So you can also have a reflection of uh, an electron into an electron. And this is called normal reflection. Uh, and this will uh, play, this plays a role in, in uh, real devices, but uh, I don't think I need that too much in, in the experiment. Um, the second thing here is that you already see that in a topological insulator, because you have this helicity in the, uh, uh, in the edge states, uh, you can only have, uh, in principle, you can only have under F reflection. Because the process by which an electron is reflected into another electron is, is forbidden by the helicity of the edge states. And this, uh, this is discussed, for example, in this paper. And this, this has been uh, uh, seen in principle in, 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 in gallium arsenide, uh, indium arsenide, gallium antimonide quantum wells, where they have been able to show that uh, there is perfect and ref reflection in quantum spinal edges. Now, this is only one interface. In a Josephson junction, we have two interfaces. Uh, then what happens when you place two interfaces? Well, naturally you form some kind of cavity where there's reflection on one side and reflection on the other side. So it's a little bit like a, a Perot Fabry cavity. And because this, there's a cavity, there are also resonant modes in this cavity, uh, which you can find, for example, in a scattering uh, formalism, where you just say that the electron here has to uh, go through this normal region where this ca there can be scattering, then it has to follow some kind of on earth reflection on that side, then it can be scattered as a whole, then it's reflected again. And if you want this to build a resonance state, then you need to have this, uh, um, this uh, cycle to be equal to identity. And this is how uh, you end up uh, having this equation to find uh, the on bound states. There are other ways to derive Andreev bound states, but this is maybe uh, the, the simplest one. Now, what's the difference between a standard Andreev bound state in a standard system and non-conventional topological Andreev bound state? Well, in a conventional Andreev, uh, in, a, in a conventional Josephson junction, uh, the Andreev bound states would typically look like this. You would have Andreev bound states which are two pi periodic. Uh, with, the, with, the, with the phase difference between the two superconducting uh, wave function. And there would typically be a gap in between at phi equals pi. So you can write this analytically under this form in the, in the case of, of the short junction limit, where d is a, is a transmission coefficient that characterizes the, tran the transparency of the Josephson junction. And here you see that there is this uh, this avoided crossing apart, apart from, uh, except for, for the case of a perfect transmission for which there is uh, um, um, a, a crossing at, at, uh, at phi equals pi. These states are spin degenerate. They are connected to the continuum of, of, uh, of states which lies above here the, the gap in the junction, which is uh, the induced gap, the, the induced um, uh, superconducting gap. And this is a generic description of what happens in a, in a Josephson junction. Now, if you replace the system by, by uh, the normal um, um, conductor by a topological uh, insulator, the Andreev bound states have, uh, are slightly different. Uh, the main difference is the fact that uh, whatever the transparency of the junction is, there will always be a protected topological, uh, topologically protected crossing at phi equals pi. Uh, you can think of this crossing here as the reminiscence of the presence of, of, of Majorana at the two superconducting interfaces. Simply, for example, you, you can just imagine that for phi equals pi, you have some kind of destructive interference in your Fabry, Perot Fabry uh, interferometer so that the, the two um, uh, Majorana bound states are, do not see each other and they are just at zero energy. But as soon as you go away from this destructive interference, uh, um, situation, then you start to hybridize this Majorana and they will form uh, two, two, uh, two states that go away from zero energy. 
because of the helicity, there's no spin degeneracy. Uh, this, this Andre bounces are not uh, degenerate. Um, but again here, the main point is the fact that there is this topological crossing at phi equals pi. And you can write this generically under this form. And you see that here, instead of having a, a cos phi term as previously, I have a cos phi over 2. And this means that generically, this Andre F bound state will not be 2 pi periodic with the phase, but have a 4 pi periodicity with the phase. And this is maybe something that you, you've read in papers. And this is this 4 pi periodicity that we've tried to detect in our experiment. Um, now again, this is a this is a cartoon. This is this is a very very naive description of of, of the Andre F spectrum in a junction, and in a real device, this is uh, much more complicated. Why? Because, for example, you can have a coexistence of conventional states and topological states. For example, if your junction is not perfectly insulating, or for many reasons, you can have. Uh, for example, in three DTIs, you can also have. Uh, just one single topologically protected state and, and uh, uh, a family of two pi periodic states. So generically, you, have, you will have many, uh, many states. You can also have uh, other effects, such as the fact that uh, if you try to work, for example, at a constant phase, and you try to detect this four pi periodicity, well, you would typically try to probe this crossing here. But now if you uh, say, um, imagine that you try to probe very gently, to change very gently the phase, then you will have some relaxation mechanism because these are excited states above the, uh, the Fermi energy. So, so there will be relaxation mechanisms and what you will only probe is this part of the spectrum. So you will recover a 2 pi periodicity. So this means that in principle you have to deal with the fact that there's a mixture of 2 pi and 4 pi states and on top of that, if you do the experiment too slowly, then you will always recover a 2 pi periodicity. So this is why in our experiments, we've done RF measurements, and I will show you how, uh, um, to, in order to, to go below this uh, relaxation time. There are other uh, um, problems that arise. One of them is the fact that when you try to include electron-electron interactions, you can have uh, eight pi periodic uh, uh, states that appear. Uh, we've tried to detect them and we've never uh, managed. We, we've looked for that and we've never managed. So it's not clear in, in, uh, uh, in our case why we don't see that. Uh, another complexity is simply the fact that on the opposite, if you drive the phase too fast, then at the crossing here, you can have non-adiabatic processes and you can move uh, here from one state to the other. And if you do that very fast, then you will just go this way and you will mimic 4 pi periodicity even though your, or your initial states are 2 pi periodic. So you have to be fast enough so that there's no relaxation, but not too fast so that you do not induce Landau Zener transitions at the crossing. Yeah? So just to quantify what times are we speaking about, like we're talking about life? Um, this, is, this, this is not really well known. Uh, I will show you in which range we've done the experiments. And uh, we, we are typically dealing with uh, times on the order of nanoseconds. We are in the gigahertz range. And this seems to be fast enough so that uh, um, there's no relaxation. We see this 4 pi periodicity. And on the other hand, uh, we've tried to evaluate, to, to estimate the role of Landau Zener transitions. And we think we can exclude this. But there's no, we don't know the scales. It, it's really, the, the scale of this relaxation processes really depends on microscopic details of the setup of, of, the, of the sample itself. And there are some experiments where they've probed this and they found uh, something which lies between nanoseconds and minutes. So it, it's really hard for us, which, uh, for, for, for us, not, not probing directly this time to, to know what, what, what this time is. Okay, so uh, now let's move on. I've, I've, I've tried to uh, here highlight the fact that the main difference uh, between uh, standard and, and uh, topological states lies in this 4 pi periodicity. At least this was the way theorists first uh, uh, thought we should be looking for it. And I will try to, to show you now how we've done to, to detect this 4 pi periodicity. First, I need to uh, go back to the Josephson equations and tell you the link between the Andreev bound states that we've just derived and the uh, supercurrent. Um, this 
comes, there, there's a direct link between the Andreev uh, bound states here, uh, the, the states, the energy states En, and the, and the supercurrent. It can be written this way, where here you have the derivative Dn d phi times uh, population factor 1 minus 2f. And um, naturally, in the case of, of uh, a tunnel junction, for example, you, you recover the first Josephson equations where I have uh, uh, highlighted this natural frequency scale, which is the Josephson frequency proportional to the voltage. But now I've told you that uh, in our case, we have some 4 pi periodicity expected in the system, which means that this sine phi contribution will now uh, um, turn into a sine phi over 2 contribution. And this means that the natural uh, uh, frequency scale is now uh, not fj, but fj over 2. So what we'll be looking now is for a change in the Josephson effect, uh, where this frequency scale fj over 2 would signal the presence of these uh, this, uh, this states. And there are two things you can do. One is simply to say, okay, I apply a constant bias. A constant bias V will create an oscillating current. This oscillating current runs into my circuit. This, this, um, uh, this circuit is like an antenna, so it will emit some radiation. And I can just collect this radiation and, an, uh, and analyze its frequency. So it's the, the simplest experiment you can think of. Uh, just apply a DC bias and measure uh, the, the frequency of the oscillating currents. The other thing you can do is say, okay, I apply now an AC bias, and I try to uh, create beatings between the internal frequency of the Josephson current and the external drive that the external AC drive that I apply. And this is known as the Shapiro effect with the formation of so-called Shapiro steps, and I will detail uh, this, this experiment later. So first, let's start with this one, uh, which is slightly... Uh, more challenging on the experimental side, but which is much more easy to understand. So first, let me uh, introduce the, the junctions very briefly. So as I told you, we work with mercury telluride quantum wells. Uh, mercury telluride quantum wells uh, exhibit a topological phase transition. If you work with large uh, quantum wells, which means large means above a critical thickness of about six nanometers, if you work about, above this, uh, this thickness, then uh, there is an inverted band structure in the quantum well, and there are uh, quantum spinal edge states which appear. On the opposite, if you now create a quantum wells which are thinner, then there is no band inversion anymore, and you recover a trivial system with no edge states. And this is, very, very, uh, this is a very efficient way for us to probe uh, whether the topology of our system has anything to do with, with what we measure, we just simply grow two types of quantum wells, one thick, thick one, one thin one, and we perform the same experiment. And I will show you that we've done, uh, the, we've, we've built these two samples and that they behave very differently. Um, let me skip this one because I don't need that very much. Uh, the Josephson junctions will, uh, will typically look like this, where we have here uh, the mercury telluride MISA that we etch. Uh, the mercury telluride quantum well is, is buried somehow uh, s s somewhere below this protective uh, cap, which is made of, of mercury cadmium telluride, which is a trivial insulator. Then we etch this cap layer to deposit the uh, aluminum to induce the superconductivity in the quantum well. And on top of this, we, we, uh, we build a top gate so that we can change the electron density uh, in, in the Josephson junction. Now, if you believed my story uh, earlier on, then there should be edge states running here, and this edge, edge state should host this, uh, these four pi periodic states. So first, let's characterize the junction. So as we, um, as we try to, to change, for example, the applied current on the junction, we, we see the following IV trace here, with here a, a region in which there's a, a zero voltage but a finite current. So this is the supercurrent branch that I mentioned earlier. And at some point below, uh, um, above this critical current, then there's a finite voltage that develops and you recover uh, this branch here. At some point, you recover an ohmic behavior and this gives you the so-called normal state resistance. And by looking at how the uh, normal state resistance and the critical currents change with the gate voltage, we can try to uh, find how our junction behaves, where 
in which case we are in the quantum spinal regime, in which case we are in a 2D regime of the conduction band, in a 2D regime of the valence band. And this is what is plotted here, where, where you have as function of the gate voltage, the critical current and the normal state resistance. And you see the following things. On the right side, you have a large critical current on the order of, of uh, a few, a few uh, microamperes um, and a very low normal state resistance. This means you're in a 2D uh, conduction regime which corresponds to the valence bands which has a high mobility and uh, which can carry large critical currents. Then at some point you see that the normal state resistance increases and the critical current decreases and this signals the gap. Here on these devices, which come from a, a first generation of devices, uh, now we can do a bit better. You only see that the resistance only slowly decreases and the critical current does not really rise anymore. But this is uh, due to a low mobility on the, on, on the valence band side, but we expect the valence band to be somewhere here. So this means here that you can identify here the conduction band, here the valence band, and here around this maximum of the normal state resistance, something which should be the, the ideal region to probe this quantum spinal uh, regime. So now let's uh, look at how we can measure the emission of these junctions. So let me show you briefly uh, uh, how we've done that. So experimentally, what we do is apply a, a constant uh, uh, DC bias to, to induce a, a, a current bias in the junction. So there's a relatively simple uh, uh, bias circuit involving some resistance, but this is just to apply a DC bias. And the only uh, uh, complexity in the setup is the fact that on one of the uh, legs of the Josephson junction, we will now col collect some of the signal here and measure the RF part here by separating this RF part from, uh, from the DC component using, uh, using this bias D. Uh, and we will collect this uh, RF part and try to analyze its frequency. So typically we, we, we connect directly the leg to here this amplification scheme, which is, only, uh, which is mainly made of, of a cryogenic amplifier. And then we analyze the frequency of the oscillating current using a spectrum analyzer. So it's the simplest experiment in which you just plug a, a DC source and you measure the uh, oscillating current on the other side. And if you do that, then you see that uh, in a narrow quantum well, which are in trivial regime, then you see that as you sweep the voltage, you see one emission peak here. And this emission peak is seen for a voltage that corresponds to the, the Josephson frequency. So remember, uh, now you have uh, you, you look at, at the detection frequency, let's say here, 3 gigahertz. You sweep the voltage and you look for which voltage you have a peak. And this voltage corresponds to uh, uh, the Josephson frequency equal to the detection frequency. Okay? So this is exactly what you expect for a trivial quantum well. Uh, this, is, this, is, uh, this has been already done in, in, the, in, the, in the 70s with, more, uh, with, more, uh, with simpler techniques. Uh, but we can reproduce this in the trivial quantum wells. Now if you go to topological quantum wells, then you see very different features. As you sweep the voltage, you see that the peak here is obtained for a voltage which is twice as big, for the same detection frequency. And a voltage twice as big means that you're measuring half the Josephson frequency. And this is a very uh, distinct feature that uh, tells us that there is current flowing at half the Josephson frequency. Now in other uh, regimes for other gate voltages, I'll, I'll, I'll detail this later, we also see sometimes the coexistence of one peak at half the Josephson frequency and one peak at the Josephson frequency. Now I told you we work at a constant detection frequency. What yeah? The, what is in the middle? Uh, you mean the red line? No, um, the right picture. Yes. So there are like double frequency and something in the middle. Uh, here? Yeah, there are sometimes satellite peaks, and I'll show you, uh, uh, you'll see that more clearly on, on the next slide. There's a lot of structure on these devices which we don't fully understand. Uh, these devices look very, very clean. These ones look more complex, and we don't fully understand. Yeah? So you have a double frequency on the middle of the picture. Yeah? But uh, there is like 2D topological isolator. You also have to have junction in the surface. 
mean, I'm not sure. I Yes. And then you have a junction to two deep topological states. Yes. Which, you, which gives you the double frequency. But what about the trivial isolator in the middle? I mean, we still. Okay. This is exactly where I, I will go later on. Because uh, here I, 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 um, I indicated roughly the, the gate regime in which we are. And here you see that there's four pi periodicity, even though we are somewhere in, on the end side in the, in the conduction band. And I'll try to. Uh, give an explanation why we think this, is, uh, this can be happening. Okay, so now we can also change the detection frequency and, change and, and check whether uh, the emission line follow the expected linear dependence with the voltage. And you see that in the trivial uh, quantum well, uh, we see only one emission line here, this red line, the, the white lines are just uh, guide for the eyes. Um, you see only one emission line which corresponds to the Josephson frequency. In the topological uh, quantum wells, we see a lot more uh, features and uh, we don't fully understand all of them. But what is clear is that there's a very strong signal here on this line, which is half the Josephson frequency. There is some signal also at the Josephson frequency and sometimes at, the, uh, at twice the Josephson frequency. But the emission lines also depend on, on where you look according to the gate voltage. But what I want to, uh, to point out here is the fact that here, the, the, uh, the, the, the strongest 4-pi uh, uh, signal is obtained for low frequencies. And this is something that will come back when we deal with the Shapiro steps. Um, now we can also look at a constant frequency but changing the gate voltage. And we obtain such plots here, where you see emission lines here as function of gate voltage. And this looks uh, for, for two different frequencies. And this looks a bit complicated. But what you can identify here is a simple region in which there are only emissions here and there. And these lines correspond to half the Josephson frequency. So this means that in this regime, more or less regardless of frequency, you have 4 pi periodic emission. And this is naturally what you would expect for perfect quantum spin uh, uh, system. On either side, you have regimes where the 4-pi uh, signal is sometimes present, sometimes absent, but also uh, there is also a standard Josephson uh, emission. And this is, um, in, in, this, in this picture, this would mean that you are entering on one side the, the conduction band and on the other side the valence band. Yeah? So this is what, what I was just about to say. Here, I, I, I have pointed out for now that the 4 pi periodicity is, is stronger at low frequency. But I have not given you any, uh, any explanation for that. And uh, this took us a lot of time to figure out what could be an explanation. It's the, the only one we found. It doesn't mean it's the right one, but uh, I'll, I'll give it to you later. But first, let me go to the Shapiro steps first, OK? Um, so okay, so this is more or less the uh, like uh, a typical set of data for the emission. Now let's move on to the more complex case of uh, NAC uh, NAC drive and the formation of Shapiro steps. And to to um, uh, to explain this, I need to go a bit beyond in explaining how the dynamics of the Josephson junction works. Uh, so far, I've told I've told you that the junction is is. Um, um, behaves and, and follows two equations, with, which are the two the Josephson equations. But to properly describe the dynamics of the junction, you also need to take into account, for example, the ohmic current, the standard uh, uh, um, ohmic current of electrons. And the simplest way to describe that is to say that the two Josephson equations are, uh, um, are given by this circuit element, but that in parallel, there's an ohmic flow of electron which can flow on the side. And this is the so-called RSJ model, resistively shin shunted junction, uh, which, uh, which is an effective engineering model uh, adopted in, in, in the late 60s. And if you compute the equations uh, given by this, uh, this simple circuit, then you can find that the equation of motion is the same as the equation of motion of a, a fictitious particle uh, depicted here in blue. Um, 
whose coordinate is, is phi, and this particle evolves in a potential which looks like this, the so-called tilted washpot potential. Um, this potential has two components. One is the tilt here, and this tilt is given by how much bias you apply, so, the, so how much current you apply on your, on your device. The other part here is the oscillating part, which comes from this uh, Josephson supercurrent. And this is where uh, it, it will make a difference later whether you have only a sine phi, so two pi periodic oscillations, or if you have a combination of sine phi and sine phi over two. But let's for now uh, forget about this complexity and let's look at the simple case. Then you can simply understand uh, the, the IV curve of a Josephson junction again. If the tilt is too small, if your bias is too small, then the particle will be trapped in one of the minimum. If the particle is trapped, then the phase is constant, then d phi dt is constant, uh, there is zero, and then v equals zero. So this is the supercurrent. I told you at the beginning of, of this lecture, when phi is constant, v equals zero. Uh, this is something you can find again in this picture. Now if you apply a stronger tilt, then at some point the particle will be able, it will be able to fall down. And if the particle falls down, then phi increases, which means that there's a finite current. And this corresponds to a tilt that is bigger than a critical tilt, which is the critical current. Okay? Now we move to a slightly more complicated case, which is the case of an AC drive, which means that you do not only apply a, a DC tilt, but you start to have an oscillating tilt like this. And if you do that, then you can understand that you can lock the motion of the particle with the oscillation of the tilt. What I mean by that is that you can find a regime in which as you lower the potential, the particle will start to move, but then you, you raise the potential again and the particle is trapped again. And if you do that many, many times, this means that the particle will move from one minimum to the next one uh, as for every cycle of, of, of the excitation. And if you, if you have such a motion, then this means that the increment of the phase, delta phi, is equal to 2 pi for each, uh, for each period of the, exci of, 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 uh, the excitation. And in that case, if you take this Josephson equation, then this means delta phi over delta t is given by this constant, which means the voltage is constant. So this means that whenever you have this phase-locked motion, you will have, uh, you will have um, uh, constant voltage steps. And these are the so-called Shapiro steps. And to show you what it looks like uh, in practice, I, I have uh, made a MATLAB simulations, and typically the motion of the particle would look like this. Now, uh, this experiment has been uh, pointed out by theorists as a good way to find this 4 pi periodicity also. Because now what you, what you have in your system is not only a sine phi contribution, but a sine phi over 2. And if this sine phi over 2 contribution dominates, then this means that the increment of the phase will not be 2 pi, but 4 pi, which means that the, uh, the Shapiro steps will have a, a doubled uh, uh, height. So basically you will only see the even steps. So to do this experiment, you can do this rather simply. You can uh, just take your, your chip with your Josephson junctions, and above the chip you, apply, you, you just place a, a coaxial cable. 37. <laughs> I have almost 10 minutes left. Oh, well. Okay, I'll try to do it fast. Uh, so you, what you do is just uh, place a coaxial cable above the junction. You send some microwaves into the cable. The cable will irradiate just as an antenna, and the junction will pick some of this excitation. And this will be enough to create this oscillating uh, excitation. Now when you do that, you typically measure IV curves that look like this, where you have Shapiro steps here, and the voltage scale on the, on, on the left side is normalized by HF over, over 2E, the expected Shapiro step height. And you see that the steps fall exactly where you, ex you expect them. This is true for the blue curve here at high frequencies, but as you lower the frequency, you see that here, there's the first step is missing. You directly go from this one to this one. Then the third step is missing, and then all the steps are recovered. And as you lower the frequency even more, then you see that the first step is missing, third step is missing, fifth step is missing, and so on and so forth. To clarify this uh, uh, even better, you can plot histograms of the voltage distribution, and they will typically look like this. At high frequencies, you will have peaks 
in the voltage distribution for every plateau in the, in the IV trace. So this will show you that there are uh, Shapiro plateaus everywhere for each value, for each in integer value. But as you lower the frequency, then you start to see that there are uh, peaks missing for, for odd steps. So this is the expected contribution. This is the expected signature of this 4 pi periodicity. Uh, now what you can do is also, this is for a given RF power. Now if you change uh, the RF power and if you look at these histograms as function of the power, for zero power, this is a theoretical plot. Uh, for zero power, you have no Shapiro steps and only the supercurrent here. But as you increase the power, then you start to have uh, increasing uh, peaks in your histogram that, that uh, show up here. But if you, d and at some point the power is so high that you've destabilized this region and you start to have a, a typical oscillating pattern. Now if you do that in our junction, you see that here for n equals one, there is no step. Uh, n equals minus one, there is no step either. But what is also missing is this first oscillation. And this is typically what you would expect also for a four pi periodic pattern where you would kill half of these lines and consequently half of the oscillations. So we cannot kill all of the odd steps. We cannot kill all of the oscillations, but at least we kill the, the, uh, the uh, smaller odd steps and, and also the uh, lowest uh, oscillations. Now we've done that also in a trivial quantum well as previously, and in a trivial quantum well, whatever we've done with uh, uh, gate voltage, frequency, uh, and so on and so forth, we've always seen all of the steps. So this is done at very low frequency where the detection uh, uh, quality starts to, to degrade. But even at this very low frequency, you see that all the steps are uh, still present. So okay, now I've shown you in these two types of experiment that we detect what the signatures that are associated to this 4 pi periodicity, uh, but only at low frequency. And this was a, uh, for us a, a puzzle for a very long time, a time uh, until we found a, a paper by uh, Fernando Dominguez uh, and Gloria Platero, uh, which gave us an explanation. And the explanation is, is in, in fact quite simple. You have to assume that in your system you always have 2 pi and 4 pi periodic states. And you you could even expect, and this is the case in our device, uh, that you have many more uh, two pi periodic states than four pi periodic states. So you would typically expect that the, the junction behaves most of the time just as a standard two pi periodic device. Um, and this is actually the case for the high frequency regime, but it's not the case for the low frequency regime thanks to the nonlinearity of the Josephson equation. So let me try to explain. Remember that these 2 pi and 4 pi periodic components correspond to the oscillations here of the tilt. If you now apply a very strong tilt, uh, um, the particle will fall down very rapidly. And if the particle falls down very rapidly, it doesn't really care whether these oscillations are 2 pi or 4 pi periodic. It just doesn't see it. The particle just falls down. This means that the, uh, the, the frequency here, the, the frequency of the oscillations will be uh, given by uh, the strongest component in the critical current. And the strongest component is the 2 pi periodic one. So this means that at high frequency, everything is almost sinusoidal at the, at the conventional Josephson frequency. But now, if you lower the tilt, so if you're very close to the critical current, then this means that the particle falls down very slowly and reaches this maximum at, with a very, very small speed. And if you have a 4 pi periodic component, then this means that some of this maximum will be slightly lower and some of this maximum will be slightly higher. And because you really, really slow down near this uh, a kink in the potential, you will be much more sensitive to the details of, this, uh, of, of the potential and you will be able to probe this uh, small 4 pi periodic component. So let me try to illustrate this with, uh, <coughs> with the simulation again. This is adding only 15% of uh, four pi periodic current. And you see that this is enough to, uh, to have um, um, Shapiro steps that evolve twice as fast, which means that in, with, for the same range of parameter, you have destabilized the first Shapiro step, which corresponds to this situation, but stabilized the four pi uh, periodic one, so the, so, the, so the n equals two step. 
So this is our attempt, our explanation for, uh, uh, to, to, to explain why you should look for 4 pi periodicity only at low frequency or mostly at low frequency. This is also a good way to extract how much 4 pi periodicity you have in the signal, in, in, your, in your device, because typically the crossover between these two regimes will depend on how much 4 pi periodic current you have in the device. And we've done that and we've estimated this to uh, about one to three modes, which is typically what you expect for, uh, um, for two edge states, one on either side of the device. And the other thing that tells you is that uh, the 4 pi periodicity tends to appear at low frequencies. And this is, you would expect completely the opposite for Landau's inner transitions, where you would expect uh, the, the, the frequency to, um, to, to, to enhance the Landau's inner transition. The faster you drive, the, the higher the, the Landau's inner probability. So this, try, this, uh, this somehow tends to show that Landau, Landau's inner transitions uh, do not play a major, major role here. Uh, with this simple RSJ model, you can, uh, adding the 4 pi periodicity in this, uh, four, uh, in this RSJ model uh, is enough to get uh, first simulations of the emission spectrum. So uh, this looks fairly similar uh, to, to, the, to the emission uh, plots I've showed you earlier with uh, a strong uh, dominating uh, signal, uh, topological signal at low frequency and, and, and no signal at the Josephson frequency at low frequency. Um, but that you tend to go back to the, to the conventional situation at high frequencies. So let me uh, finish this by summarizing this on a plot. And you will see that, OK, uh, we have observed two types of, of uh, signals that tend to show that there's 4 pi periodic uh, Josephson effect in our devices. First, uh, the 4 pi periodic Shapiro effect, and a second emission at half the Josephson frequency. But the strange thing is that uh, even though these two features are stronger in this region, they can be seen over a wide range of gate voltage. Um, and also, the, the strong features are not exactly where you would expect uh, uh, the quantum spinel to be the stronger because you're not close to this, uh, um, to this maximum in the resistance. So, so there is still some puzzle to be solved. We have some first uh, explanations. In particular, if you look at the band structure, you can see that uh, the, uh, because of, of, the, um, of the flatness of the valence band, the quantum spinal edge states are rapidly killed in the valence band, but can survive next to the conduction band for, for up to very high energy, and they can coexist in principle according to band structure calculations. Uh, this is one possible explanation. Uh, but again, this calls for more, uh, for more experiments that will actually uh, confirm this, this topological origin of this 4 pi periodicity. And one thing that uh, my colleagues in Würzburg are, are trying to do right now is to have uh, signatures of the gapless andreev bound states not via the Josephson supercurrent, but by directly probing their spectrum. Uh, this is something that has been done uh, in Orsay a few years ago where you, you use microwaves again to resonantly excite uh, the, the Josephson, uh, the Andreev doublet. And by looking at how uh, uh, the microwaves are absorbed, depending on the phase difference in the junction, you can directly reconstruct the, the, uh, the Andreev spectrum. And this is something that uh, they, they try to do now in Würzburg. And also, in principle, we could do extend this type of measurements in other systems. Uh, mercury telluride is quite versatile. I told you that uh, this is also a 3 DTI, but you can also grow mercury telluride nanowires. You can also go to other fancy regimes like vial or quantum anomalous. And with uh, this, I thank you for your attention. Which, which one? Uh, just the oh, the spectrum. Yeah. Yeah, the spectrum are for simplicity for, for 1D system, yeah. Because here you have a special extension. Yes. I guess you would have some yes. 
So for the edge states, this 1D picture should, should be enough, but indeed there, there should be some 2D states in the conduction band and in the valence band. And they are depicted as, as uh, 2D conventional states, but it disregards completely the spatial extension of these states. Yeah, it's true. I also think that in that case, you have, instead of having just zero modes, uh, topological zero modes, you have propagating modes. So yeah, you can. Uh, you, you can have many, many states that correspond, for example, to different KYs. This is one description that you can, you can, you can adopt, yeah. Okay, so this, this, I mean, there's no, to my knowledge, there's no very accurate description of these devices that would compute the whole spectrum in a very realistic <coughs> case. Uh, you're welcome to do that if you know how to do that. Yes. I know these systems can be linked. Is it also the 4-5 error that, that is being Yeah, so there's a, there's a very old paper from, uh, very old. There's, a, there's a, a paper by Yakovenko, which came a, a little bit earlier than this Fu and Kane paper where they pointed out this 4 pi periodicity. But uh, this um, Yakovenko paper just tells you that in junctions between P-wave superconductors, you, you expect this 4 pi periodicity, this is also, uh, it also treats the case of D-wave superconductors and so on. So this 4 pi periodicity is the sign of this helicity uh, in the edge states and it's equivalent to, to P-wave superconductivity, to this P-type correlation. At least it has the same signatures. Okay, um, this has, uh, there, there were a few papers who, uh, which pointed out the fact that um, the edge states are supposed to touch the continuum. And if you include the coupling to the continuum and electron-electron interactions, then uh, there's a reconstruction of the Andreev bound states and it yields a 8 pi periodicity in the system. And I'm not sure I can explain the theoretical uh, details very well. I'm, I'm pretty sure I cannot, actually. Uh, but we became aware of this 8 pi periodicity uh, while doing the measurements, so we, we immediately looked for it, and we could not find it. And then came afterwards another set of papers uh, who actually said that, okay, the fundamental frequency should be 8 pi periodicity, but the strongest signatures will be found at 4 pi uh, with a 4 pi periodicity. So it's not very clear to me. There are sort of contradicting papers uh, or, or not. There's, there's not a consistent uh, story to me. But what I can say is that most of these papers are theory papers and they overlook somehow the complexity of the device. Uh, the coupling to the continuum is only imposed by time reversal symmetry and it may be broken for many reasons just uh, uh, in, in the device, so maybe this coupling to the continuum is not as strong as, 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 uh, as, uh, as modeled. So there are, there's, some, there's something to be understood there. I would expect so, yeah. But I've never uh, uh, thought about this very much in detail. I would expect that, yes. Very good. I think we have to move on. So let's thank everyone again.